One, two, three, go. Welcome, Welcome to, to Muay Thai, Thai Bones <laughs> Library Coffee Edition. <laughs> Library Coffee Edition. <laughs> Name pending. <laughs> Name pending. Okay. Uh, normally we do the Library Coffees right after we film the Muay Thai uh, Library session mm -hmm. with a legend or a, a really awesome crew in Thailand. Uh, we ran into uh, some technical issues right after Sylvie filmed with um, Samson Hassan. Samson Hassan. So we're doing our reflections on the Samson. <laughs> Not only is it library coffee edition, it's home edition. Home edition. <laughs> but we have coffee. <laughs> coffee and we're at home uh, on our couch <laughs> uh, instead of driving in the car or as we do for library coffee sitting in a cafe somewhere. Yeah, so we call the car our other couch and the couch is our other car. Totally. So um, if you're new to the Library Coffee uh, podcast, what we do is we kind of reflect on a Muay Thai library session that was filmed and draw out some of the larger Muay Thai or um, even life, well, maybe not life, lot of more type principles that were in the session so that even if you don't watch the library session, you can get something out of what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and it's kind of like first impressions of the experience of that filming. Too. Um, then Sylvie will go and rewatch the session and, uh, to study it. And voice it. And then she'll voice it. So when, sh when your voice comes on, it's really the third time going through <laughs> the session. It's a multi-phase process. <laughs> it's actually really cool though. It because is cool because you see different things each time. You see new things. And you do film, it's like film study yeah, uh, and uh, of, your, of yourself. When I'm actually doing it, like when I'm actually filming it, there are things that I feel that mm. then when I watch it, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was happening. <laughs> like that's, that's why that worked or that's why that felt that way or something like that. Totally. So it's um, getting to see a more 360 view of what was going on. And so Samson Hassan, if you don't know who he is, is incredible. <laughs> there is no... You know, we say this a lot about legends, there's nobody like him, and mm. it's often true, there is nobody like whomever. Uh, but Samson Hassan had this, like, incredible Moy Cow forward-pressing style that, um, he was also a professional boxer, 43-0 and 0 as a pro boxer. With how many knockouts? 36, I think, out of 43 wins. He was a powerful boxer. What's so cool about Samson Hassan, he was fighter of the year in 1991, so he was Yod Moy, and also had a prodigious boxing career. And I'm always interested in these people like boxing and Muay Thai, they're totally different, they're incompatible. But as we've talked about with like Char Chai and uh, Yod Sanan, other boxers in the Muay Thai library, um, Thais see no firm line between boxing and Muay Thai. Yeah, the crossover is not a difficult one. There, there are fighters who have way more success in Western boxing than others. Um, Gansok was a very good boxer, but did not like well, he, excel he, as a boxer. He was, so he wasn't was a very insane. good boxer. That's he had what I'm very saying. good hands. I'm saying that there yeah. are there are crossovers where you're like, yeah, I can do both, and then there are crossovers who you're like, fuck, well, he was a really good boxer. It was interesting because you're friends with Gansok. He was one of your first um, crews uh, back when you were in New Jersey or in, a, in America, trained with him in New Jersey at AMA, and he said he had very good explosive hands as a Yod Moy Muay Thai fighter, and he told you that the, he try, was trying to transition into boxing. He said his problem was his footwork. He didn't Yeah, he said he my hands were great, part. but my feet didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I literally said they didn't work. And this is one of the, we, I don't know, what did we watch so long ago? But it was a Cuban national team coach, and he was, I think it was like Fight Quest or something. They mm -hmm. went to like Cuba. To, they go, travel around learning different fighting styles. And he was like, the coach was criticizing the Westerner and he was like, his hands and feet don't move together. Yeah, like he's divided. His upper body and lower body don't, don't coordinate. And I think that's something that Western boxing has on a lot of Muay Thai technique is that Western boxing, probably because so much fighting is in that trench warfare zone, in the hitting zone, the hands and feet and the head all move together in mm -hmm. Western boxing because you, you always have to kind of like create these angles of attack and defense. Whereas Muay Thai tends to be more upright, uh, they tend to fight from a little bit further distance and hands and feet don't have to be uh, synchronized in the same way as they do with boxing. Well, that was an interesting thing. 
experientially about um, this session with Samson. Samson is in the Muay Thai library. He has, we have a session with him before, and he's not a trainer. He's a taxi driver in oh, Bangkok. That's so incredible. And so we, he like rolls up in his taxi to teach me, and he's like, Pre Previously, the first session. The first session, and he's like, What do I do? And I'm like, Just show me your style. And he was like, Okay, <laughs> and just start fucking like juggernaut charging me. This time he's more comfortable teaching, which is cool. But the thing experientially about his like juggernaut pulsing max guard is that it brings your consciousness so high mm. that you do not realize it's all in his as, feet as at all. You're saying it brings whose consciousness? My so consciousness. You're like fuck. When you're as he's like when you're suffering it. It's like yeah. If you have bees in your face, yeah. you're not paying attention to whatever's going on with the snakes around your legs or whatever. Like it's. He's, well, this is he's the, using the, footwork and he's actually hitting my legs and he's kicking and he's doing things like this, but you're like not aware. You're just going to suffer all of that because all your consciousness is up here. The, so this is kind of interesting in the, talking about the melding of boxing and Muay Thai is that because boxing has kind of elevated awareness, uh, maybe footwork and technical levels in the fighting zone, like mm. in that two feet of what we call like the, the no man's land, the trench warfare, what Samson Hassan was able to do is he was able to fight up a lot, watch the three Pepsi versus, Pepsi's a, a golden age fighter, three very tall. Pepsi versus Samson Hassan fights, the first two were draws, then this huge third fight. It just, they're incredible if you want to see clinch fighting. <laughs> it was two Muay Thai fighters just going at it nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. But because he's able to attack in that no man's land because of his high level boxing, mm. I mean, 43 and 0, 36 knockouts, he is able to take advantage of this kind of like blind spot, I think, for many Muay Thai fighters. And it made him incredibly difficult to, um, to face another Muay Thai fighter who is not yet in the Muay Thai library, but we're going to really try hard. We've been reaching out, uh, we're upon. Mm. He preferred to fight it more. He became a huge WBC champion for maybe six years or something after his Muay Thai career, but he preferred to fight Muay Thai more at Muay Thai distance. Samson is, a different, is different. He's like, I'm going to smother he's you. He's suffocating. Yeah. He's suffocating. And he's not a like, I'm going to wrap myself around you kind of suffocating. Like it's Nam like, Noi or something? Or what, what's... <sighs> Like, he's not grabbing you all the time. When he mm. grabs you, he hits you, and then he lets you go and pushes you again or yeah. something. It's like catch but and release. <laughs> like, catch and release. There's, if you listen to my voiceover of my own fights, um, which are all on YouTube, I talk about Dern a lot and how important Dern is and how I'm learning how to Dern differently. Dern in Thai literally just means to walk, but it's used in commentary of talking about fighting, which is how you walk forward. It's how you close space. When you're watching fights and you're listening to the commentary, they say which fighter is derning, like who's pressing forward. So that's what that concept is. Samson's dern is fucking unbelievable. It's the okay. So uh, Yod Kun Pan, the elbow mm. hunter of a hundred stitches, who's Good at my gym, he's, Good he's uh, in the Muay Thai library. He's absolutely incredible. He has this gallop. He's like a. I, I say it's like a party balloon the day after the party, how it kind of just like bounces along the ground. And then he fucking slashes you. It's like knives attached to the, to the balloon. He and Samson actually kind of grew up together. They're different ages. So Samson is like younger than Yod Kun Pan and he's like, oh yeah, we trained together. He was a good runner. You feel Samson's well, a good Roy, runner. Royette is where they're from, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah. So we so, let people know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the way that Samson turns is not like Yod Kun Pan's gallop forward. Mm. It is this plodding, relentless, like, you feel the metronome and your heart starts well, matching Let me, ask, let me like, ask you that big difference it. because, oh, who is that? Uh, I just interviewed him for uh, the relationship between dance and Muay Thai. Ties. T ties. He, a Westerner took some privates with Yod Kun Pan and was like, he is eating space and time. Yeah, you can feel Like it. in his Dern, you just, it's like he's like suddenly, like how the zombie is suddenly on you more. So it was suffocating in a way, and I really, it'd be interesting to talk about these, like the difference between the suffocation of one and the suffocation of another. The, the, you can see it visually, but what does it feel like? The weird thing about Yod Kun Pan 
is he gets his hook in you. Mm, yeah, he has that. So it feels yeah. like you have time. Like it mm. feels like he's far away. It feels like he's slower. You're like, okay, he's not. He's not coming that fast, kind of thing. But it's mm. like how um, a dolphin or some like aquatic calm. Yeah, animal is yeah. just kind of you're like how am I not getting away from you it's like <laughs> yeah. I can't, there's nowhere to go but he's got his like harpoon in yeah. so you're like dragging him everywhere you go you're already on the line yeah, so it's like yeah. it doesn't matter how fast you go you're on the line he's That's gonna come after you such a beautiful analogy baby but but you're so awesome and Samson, Samson is like the fucking whale ramming the boat where <laughs> you're like he literally, I get out he of the literally boat. puts his forearms in guard. Like he grabs the top of his head and elbows out and just like batter rams you almost at times. Yeah. And I was doing it back to him and he was like, yeah, like he really liked it. Like it's um, an antler fight or something. But you can't win that fight with him. It's like the Beatles, yeah. the um, Chong. The Guang Chong, the like uh, wrestling Beatles. Be Beatles. They're yeah. locked in and it's just like this. And it's like there's no space between you and you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna win that. <laughs> Even though it's like he's into it, and you're like right on there's it. There's also he's really bigger than there's I am. also that's everybody. You yeah, can just say a footnote. I'm just saying if <laughs> I don't know that it would make a difference. I might be able to intimidate him more if I were. Bigger. I don't know, baby. He is. There's another thing that's very interesting about, and I find it cool that they're both from the same. They spend time in the same gym in Royette, a, a town, a little city in um, Isan. They both have an advancing, suffocating style, but a totally different energy about so it. Different, yeah. But he's he also ha he has a great joy to his Dern. He like he's constantly laughing and giggling and playing. He wasn't doing that when he was fighting, but there is this weird childlike exuberance how he's like on you, on you, on you, on you, and he's like almost cracking up how much he's on you. Yeah. Like, that joy is super important because that's the energy you bring in training. It's, it's funny, his play name is Joy, but oh, really? in what? Thai it means cute. It doesn't mean Go ahead, joy, say the Thai, don't hide it. Joy. Oh, it's actually Joy. <laughs> it's joy. Yeah. So it's a, a loan word. No, no, no. His name, his play name is Joy, but Joy in Thai means cute. Oh, I it see doesn't mean, mean Joy, uh. but it's, for us it means Joy, and he is so joyful. He's got this like, the smile that covers the width of his face that when he breaks into it, it's so, like, a lot of Thai men are boyish yeah, totally. late into life. Well, a lot, especially fighters. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's on the young end of a lot of the um, legends that he kind of, like, fits in with. He's, like, the little brother. Um, but he has this, like, I remember in our first session when he did something that was very, like, juggernaut forward, um, and I was like, that's beautiful. And he just, like... <laughs> His face just lit up with a smile, like, because he has joy in what he's doing. Yeah, so for but, someone but else to be was, like, that's incredible. He was smiling because he's probably thought of as an ugly fighter in Thailand. Like, I don't think he, that his technique is called beautiful. Has been ever, <laughs> ever been called beautiful. It is beautiful, though. But it's very beautiful. But he was, like, taken aback. This is one of the interesting things about being a Westerner or a foreigner in a country is that you get a line of, you know, a lot of it is uh, exoticized or... Um, you blow things out of proportion because you don't understand the culture and how things fit. But one of the advantages of coming as a Westerner is you're allowed an insightful line of vision that somebody within the culture can't really see. Mm. And so for somebody like uh, Yod Kumpan, he had a like slashing elbow style that the Westerners love. Thais thought this is ugly. This is not high level fighting. Yeah. It's, we study with him and we're like, and he himself knows I developed a whole fighting system just nobody appreciates it mm. because elbows were seen as kind of like a, a thuggy, un, uh, artful uh, mode of fighting, especially when you throw lots of them yep. instead of one perfect elbow that cuts like Karahat would do. And so Samdan Hassan, as the, as the Moy Cow Dern uh, puncher, probably was never, no one has ever called his style beautiful, but as a Westerner, you're able to, cut through some of that cultural bias. It's mm. kind of a bias because he's a very artful fighter, but on the end of Muay Cao, which is not the femur, mm. you know, the kind of like princely Muay Thai. Mm. And it's kind of cool for us to like communicate that beauty to 
people outside of Thailand, but it was also cool to, to let him feel appreciated yeah. in a way that he literally has never been appreciated. Like, yeah. everybody's like a, uh, we have Arjun Gimyu, who um, was a fighter, uh, a trainer of um, Gansak and Pinu and other legends. Um, and he, I was sitting next to him, he's 78 years old now, and he was trying to tell me about his student, Lakin. Is that it? Lakin. Lakin. And the first thing he said to me was, nobody beats Samson, Lakin beat Samson. He said he knocked him out, didn't he? I think that's the only way. He, that's what, <laughs> that's, it's like, Tyson knocked somebody out. Lakin was a devastating puncher. Uh, but what, the, the, what was so interesting to me was, yeah, Samson doesn't have the calling card of beautiful fighter, but this is a 78-year-old legendary trainer talking to a Western dude who knows, as far as he knows, knows nothing about Muay Thai. And the first thing he says about his own student was, nobody beat Samson. He didn't know that I know Samson. Lakin beat him, mm. beat him, knocked him out. Yeah, I think he just said beat him. This was a calling card. Like, when you're the guy that a victory against you counts as something that you're recounting 25 years later or yeah. 20 years later, I don't know how long, is pretty cool. He's a very, very special fighter. I want to stay on that little thing, though, about his joy, is that you're training, I'm very big on this, like, training affects, training the emotions you have around techniques. So one of the problems of being hypercritical of yourself and always correcting your technique and always being like, meh, 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 or slide whistle against your own technique. We see it with Diesel Noy, who's in the library and in our gym right now. He's, he's not giggling when he's doing knees, <laughs> right? He trains a very vicious seriousness, yes. but he's giggling all, all around the, the knees. Yeah. Like, in the ring, he's yeah. giggling the whole time. But then when he's doing it, he's like a fucking assassin. Samson's actually giggling during his knees, like he has a, his joy. But this is what's so important is that the Muay Thai training is so intense and so hardcore that you're really not ascending to the highest level of it unless you're training with those affects mm. of some kind of joy. Yeah. It's the most workmanlike and aggressive form of Muay Thai, but it has to have that joy in it. And when you see the live, there's, a library session already up. The second one, you might, whenever you're watching this, might, you might also be, uh, go be able to see the one we're talking about. Watch his joy. Mm. Like, it's not a small thing. It's a very, very big part of really high level Muay Thai fighting. He was also inviting me into that joy the whole time. He mm. beat the shit out of me in this session. Like, not a really. lot of it is not sparring. Really. He's not heart hurting you. He overwhelmed you Kevin quite a bit. Kevin watched from the outside. I yeah. felt it. Okay. <laughs> this is the Amy Davis. <laughs> But he's, no, 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 he wasn't hitting me hard at all. Yeah. No, I don't, not at all. Okay. Um, it's like a, it's like a pit bull playing with a kitten. Yes. And you're like, yeah, that's yeah, amazing yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But yeah. the kitten is not like, yeah. this is so light. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, but he was true. constantly inviting me to that joy where I would be completely overwhelmed, like completely overwhelmed while he's like steamrolling me. And his joy in calling out his points and like all this thing is like, you could laugh at it. like. I, there were times that I was like it was a lot of fun. I was I was laughing really hard, and it's like you can actually get on the wagon and hit him back if you join in the joy. If you get all stressed and are like yeah. I'm overwhelmed, there's no way out of it. But I um, think the challenge is to bring that joy into everyday training. Yes, and it's one of the secrets of Thailand training, is that it's so long and so hard, and the people that really invest in are often from boyhood on, right? So they learn play as a major component of it. And I'm like, you got to learn joy in, in the fatigue, in the endlessness of it. Like, you don't release all of your capabilities of your body if you cannot laugh. No. Right? And he's like laughing all the time. And every Muay Cow Dern fighter has their own emotion why are you laughing? Because it's like if you tried to swim stressed, you're, yes, yes, you're yes. drowning. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't, it won't work. If you get all fucking tense trying to swim, you don't move, you don't Insane. breathe, and you drown. Yeah. Um, fighting is very much like that. Yeah, but swimmers aren't usually laughing when they're doing their thousand laps. No, but the but relaxation, like yes. the, the, 
I was listening to Joe Rogan and Edward Norton today, mm. and Edward Norton made this really good point. He was like, people completely misunderstand what combat training is. They think it's about like getting in this like fighting killer mentality, but it's actually a very long process of learning to relax. Oh, is and that, did he say that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, he's a, he did uh, Aikido or something, oh. and then got into jujitsu mm. or something. But um, it's totally that like picking the little pieces of of joy. Like you would not think that Samson's style is joyful. His whole max protect hands like this, all of this stuff is so that he can breathe mm. underwater in this space yeah. that people ask me, they're like, when you train with all these different people and they show you all these different techniques, is it confusing? And I, I don't know, maybe a long time ago it was, it's not anymore because I understand where it fits in the overall context of what it's expressing about that fighter. And his max protect, you can't fight like Karahat and have that max protect, but you can pull from each of those when you understand the context in which they're using those techniques for their purposes. Right. Um, and so it's like understanding the like There's another component of what he's teaching that I'm excited about for you in particular because you're a very strong clinch and lock fighter. Mm. He's not a locking fighter actually. We're like, show <laughs> us your lock and he's like, I don't even know what a lock is. He just kind of like I controls. locked him and he just like picked me up off of him. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> like, that's a little bit of a side thing. It's not. Yeah. A, that's not actual Muay Thai, but <laughs> it's funny. But okay, <laughs> let me go down the road a little yeah. bit. He's not a locking fighter. There's a big difference in the Muay Cao clinch fighting of the Golden Age and of the age that followed yes. after. Yeah. Muay, Cao, Muay Thai became the the clinch ver aspect of Muay Thai became much more lock oriented. Which, like in the uh, like Pet Boon Chu or uh, Yod Wicha, who's in the library, the lock and the control of the body with framing became much more emphasized and, mu and strength became much more important. But back in his day, Moi Cao was, you controlled the body, but, but not by fixed positions, but by constantly con uh, leveraging and um, changing angles. Mm. It, was, it was much more like snakes intertwined. Yeah. But, this is what's kind of interesting to me is that he has a very close level of uh, area of fighting which involves controlling the body and kneeing, but also he has these vicious uppercuts oh. that are just... And he throws a lot of them. He's, like they he, just well, keep coming. Well, when he, he, he doesn't always throw a lot of them, no. but he, ha he can throw a lot of them. And th this is what's so interesting to me as you as a locking fighter. It's like if you can get a little more freedom of movement, scrambling in American wrestling, like Ben Askren, more scrambling, and then include the inside boxing weapons of the uppercut and the hook. Mm. Because if you can uppercut and hook in the fight zone, in the two feet, the, the no man's land, then people cannot just like focus on defeating your lock. Yeah. Because a lot of the f female fighters you fight, they're just waiting for the neck grab, mm -hmm. right? And then you have this uh, difficulty with Nong Ploy a couple of fights ago. She was just loading up on the face smush. That's all she was doing. If someone wants to load up on the face smush and they have and they and they have to defend uppercuts and hooks, <laughs> they're dead, yeah. right? They're dead. The only reason why it can work for some opponents is that they don't have to defend in the in the uh trenches yeah and that's what i'm kind of hoping for is this aspect of for you to work on this like being able to strike out of the one and two feet yes and take that from him a little bit yeah and keep it like keep the fight at that distance by staying in the way he does by turning the way that he does what do you mean my, opponent, don't pop my out, opponents don't run pop backwards out. so if you're facing someone who's running backwards and you don't have a solid turn there's always that much space between you but mm. with the way that he comes forward and the contact that he makes, it's like, it's going to stay this close. Like and this is one of the secrets of Moi Cao, uh, the Moi Cao f fighting style, is that if you fight at your range, the, you take away like 80, 90% of the weapons of the female fighter. Yeah. Like, they literally can't do the things that they've practiced and exhibited much of their life. Mm. Especially these days, because female fighters, technical fighters, 
tend to have a much more limited vocabulary than they did in the 1990s in the golden age. Yep. Because then everybody could do everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe not to the point of absolute excellence, mm -hmm. but you could survive at all distances. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is like, um, I don't know, one of the, is there something going on there? No, I just had to double check that it didn't stop anything by the announcement. Mm. Uh, so one of the secrets about Moikao's success, and he's like a radical example of this, is that by fighting in this zone, your opponent very likely, if there are more, especially like a, a, a lot of uh, Thai female fighters are distance fighters, mm -hmm. you're taking them out of their entire vocabulary. And then the fight is just like, the fight is really what distance are we gonna fight at? Totally, it's like if you have like a, I, I call it the atomic squirrel when I get all up on someone, because I'm yeah. so much smaller than all of my opponents, that when you get into that distance, I say that I'm like a squirrel getting into the gearbox of like a robot. It's like mm. in those Star Wars fight scenes, you have this big, beautiful robot that can destroy everything. But if you get on it, it can't do anything. Yeah. Like it's that distance just does not work. And I think one of the challenges, there's this weird thing. Nobody knows. Nobody really wants to fight in that trench there. And that for you, you hop across. A lot of people do this when they're clinching is that last foot and a half, two feet, people like jump across that space instead of using that space to attack. Mm -hmm. Having that wherewithal, like that, that's kind of what's interesting about his style is because so much of it is max protect, max protect, I think that's also to keep you calm in the hitting zone. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because he's gonna be hit on the way in He's a gonna lot, be hit, and lot. that's one of the harder things in Moy Cow fighting is accepting that you're gonna be hit. Mm -hmm. Like, um, a, lot of, a lot of people feel like if you get hit, you've made a mistake. Yeah, or you're at a deficit. Yeah. But it's like, no, I just haven't gotten to my range yet. Yeah, and uh, we watch like Yokum Pan fights and uh, just keep track how many times kicks land against yeah. them. Like, part of the Moy Cow style is you need to accept that you're gonna go down in points mm -hmm. at times in the fight. And I think the hardest, one of the hardest things if you're learning the Moy Cow style is to not stop when you're hit mm. and do that little mental edit like, mm -hmm. your block's not up, you know, this inner coach kind of thing. Because in Thailand, the, the crews will be like, check, block, 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 they'll yell at you, right? And it's almost self-defeating in a weird way, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know, you're just nodding me now. You'd... No, I know what you're talking about, but it's, uh, it's too nuanced what I'm thinking. We don't have Why to get into it. Why tell me? I think that when I'm being yelled at, block. Mm. If I had not blocked, which I didn't, which is why they're yelling at me, mm. but had the attitude of a Muay Cow fighter, which is mm. fuck you, I don't care that I didn't block. My yeah. point is two beats after this. Yeah. They wouldn't be like Sylvie Block. It's that I kind of yeah. pause. It's that I kind of like, yeah. I, I interact you invite, with the kick. <laughs> you invite the criticism in yeah. a weird way. It's my response to the kick. It's not that I didn't block it. Of course, they prefer that you block it because then you negate the point. Yes. But I don't think that Pinu or Diesel Noy would be like, block, 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 if I was just fucking terminatoring through. But what's weird is that little hesitation that comes after the kick lands, which feels instinctive, is also a signal to the judges. Yes. So in training, your, your crew sees that little hesitation and they're like, block. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, the, but it's the ref yeah. who sees it and he's like, point? Yeah. Like, the registry of a point. That's very interesting, that's very subtle. I'm glad you brought that up, because a lot of times we're taking what the crew is saying as like the gospel of how you have to be, but it's actually a, a interaction. The camera turned off. Oh. Yeah. Okay, Good, rolling. Baby. So, uh, continuing on, we just, the camera turned off, I think. Um, what I was saying was, we take the crew, what the crew is saying is kind of like the gospel and we always try to, you try to measure up to the high standards of the person teaching you. But there's a really subtle thing that's going on in training, in Thailand especially, uh, I think, is where it's a dialogue between your performance in training and your crew's relationship to you in a weird way. Mm. So like you said, the crew is saying to you to block but that's really coming out of your own emotional experience of the of the actions in a weird way. Yeah. So 
there's two things to do when your crew says block. One is block, <laughs> but the other is say, fuck it, I'm gonna show you what happens when I don't block. Yeah. Like, now comes the body shot. Now yeah. comes the like, swagger. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever those things are. You have to, We've. this is something very interesting about Pinu because he's a fucking great trainer, especially in this area, that if you show him something, like a, um, a way of fighting or a technique, and you sell it to him, he'll be like, I see what you're doing. Yeah. And then he'll like embellish it or this is how that folds into what I'm already talking about. And this is that kind of version about this, about walking through strikes, is that you have got to sell it to your trainer. Well, that's the thing about Samson's Dern and Samson's Max mm. Protect. He has this whole thing where instead of keeping your hands like this, which a lot of people do, or this, he has it like this, like his fist yeah, is like flush against his hands. hands on the top of his hand. head sometimes. And it's like, I'm sure lots of trainers were like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> when he did that. But then you're like, I see what you're doing there. Like, I yeah, see what that is because yeah. he kept with it or he turned it into his thing. Yeah. And so you have to see what he's doing there if you're going to take it yes. to like work on it. But being able to like punch out of that, being able to fucking juggernaut in, being able to like pulse with it. Yes. Like if you're going to keep your hands like this, that is not a like, that punch does not come out easily. But for him, they do because he's contact, contact, contact. Well, not only that, his hands are up on his head. He has a boxer's roll. Yeah. He rolls, right? So that's a, actually a good position that if you're going to roll to the, to the right, it becomes a defensive shield. Mm. And if you roll to the left, it becomes an uppercut or a hook. Yeah. It's, it's cocked and loaded. It's not ideal for punching straight. No, you also have to be really close. Yes. That is not a like, I'm going to keep true. this comfortable distance and do that. And it's one of the interesting things about boxing is that you draw contact, you draw punches, you want to get hit in your guard because when you're, when you're hit in the guard, that means there's a counter opening. Yeah. So a lot of boxing is actually landed strikes on guard. Yeah. Um, it's not this evasive, you never touched me kind of thing, although you know, was, other boxers, you know, um, You noticed Mayweather's that like when that. he was trying to teach me the like roll around mm. is that he's actually just shoving his shoulder into me most of the time, Got which it. is this like, you think you know what you're looking at when you see someone doing something. Yes. Like, Westerners are familiar with Sanchai, so I'll use Sanchai as an example. He's so evasive and so, he moves so much and he's tricky and all this stuff that when people imitate him, they do it from like four feet away and you're like, that's not how he fights. He's actually super close. So you think you know what you're looking at, but what he's actually doing is like what Karahad does is creating intense Ten. tension yes. in his opponent to freeze them. Yes. So it's like, it's like, I know how that superhero works. And you're like, no, Spider-Man wrapped him in a web first. <laughs> like, yeah. that's how it works. That's a very good point about uh, Sanchai's uh, proximity is that he's doing that shuffle two feet or three feet from you. I mean, sometimes he does it far away for show, but he's using it as a weapon to fucking freeze you. And when it's in the fighting space, that's really freezes yeah. you. And I think a lot of Westerners, just don't anticipate that when they're gonna fight him. They're like, oh, I'm not gonna fall for the foot thing. And then, and then he, his proximity creates alarm, like mm. instinctive alarm. And I think that Samson, did, because he's not more familiar, he's durning on you. He's creating that tension in a different way, in a boxerly yeah. way. And this is one of the other cool things about Samson and the melding of that kind of infighting uh, with uh, Muay Thai, is that Muay Thai generally and there's criticism of it is very like mono track, like forward and back, forward and back. A high level fighter like Nam Sok Noi is cutting the angles. That phone call, uh, cutting the angles. So he's moving off of that one dimension and um, Karahat is moving the angles, right? Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a boxerly version of that kind of like breaking the angles down. Don't stay just forward, back, forward, back as a lot of Muay Thai mm. gets fought. And I think that when you can move in that other dimension, getting the foot outside, getting that kind of like body hook the angle. Corralling. That corralling, like he was corralling. In the, in the session, he's like literally, he's punching Sylvie, but he's not even punching her. He's just using his arms it's to like, like shoo, shoo, to shoo. shooing like a cat into a corner or something or a chicken. <laughs> yeah, but it's actually part of the body movement of taking that angle so that you have the uppercut or the hook. <clears throat> and this is something that's so interesting to like meld that with knee fighting. Mm. It's like 
evil. <laughs> how, like, how could you defend both? If you think of like good inside, like Roberto Duran inside knee fighters of Western boxing, can you imagine if he could grab and knee you? Mm -hmm. I mean, not knee, but uh, yeah, yeah. inside uh, fighters, body yeah. <clears throat> body punch fighters. If he could also grab and knee. That's what Samson Hassan is. Mm. And it's a very cool, like, um, I don't know. I would say that if you're interested in boxing and Muay Thai, explore the relationship between Muay Cow and boxing, mm. right? And Samson's a perfect example of that. Totally. Anything else we could take from this session that, uh, I mean, um, I don't know. I got kind of like on a sidetrack there. You're looking at me fun. like. It was fun. It was fun. I don't know. <laughs> I love Samson. He's fun. Well, to work we're with. gonna try to see about bringing him to um, to the gym for three days mm. in December, because I want you to kind of soak up in him, in his energy and his joy. Um, this is the other thing. It's like you find you find legends that speak to you, like their poetry speaks to you, like Karhat speaks to you, and you try to like imitate them and feel it. But then other times you're just like trying to like. I love how he does this one thing, mm. this one little move or this feeling of something and you start like taking borrowing yeah it reminds me very much of like poetry like i was thinking today like we were riding uh down um on the motorbike after breakfast and i was thinking how would our how would arguments of uh who is the greatest fighter ever be if they were conducted like who is the greatest poet ever mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could be like Shakespeare or whatever, Milton. Yeah. But you know what? It's like, uh, in the end, it's kind of an aesthetic yeah. th thing. And so just like poets borrow from other poets, like mm. I love how he uses verbs or his, t his topics. I think you do that also with the Muay Thai library and the legends, like, and you're lucky that you actually get to experience yeah. their energy. But we try to also capture the energy yeah. as well. He's a good one to steal from because it's like, in the same way that Yod Kun Pan is this light, mm. floating, like gent like soft spoken dude who's just gonna slice your face open, the like boyish, joyous thing about Samson that's also like pummeling yeah. is this weird contrast. It's very cool. I, I think it's very cool to have both these guys in the library. I mean, you make me want to like watch the two, <laughs> watch <Do it. laughs> watch what they they're two different styles. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's the Muay Thai library, uh, Muay Thai coffee, wait, what are, Muay Thai? Library coffee. Library coffee, Name Muay Thai tending. bones <laughs> uh, edition. If you're listening right now on iTunes or as a podcast, that means you're already a patron. Thank you. Uh, so um, if you're watching the video, you can get all of our uh, Muay Thai bones podcasts as a patron. That's a dollar a month, plus access to one of the most insane documentary um, archives of Thai technique. Um, if you're listening to this as a podcast, immediately following this will be the audio um, version of the session. So Sylvie's voiceover. You won't be able to see the techniques, but you'll get a, it's a nice light, a low friction way of experiencing the library, maybe like on the way to work or mm. something like that. Um, and if you're watching on a video, there'll be a link in the description eventually uh, to the published uh, session. All right, so till next time, cue music. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> 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 okay, that was good, baby.